Afternoon. How birthday, Rhonda? Doing good for 50? That's on camera. Um, if you've got your Bible, turn to Galatians chapter 4, please. While you're doing that, I'll pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we can come to you um, this morning. Thank you that we can come together and, and worship and exalt you for what you've done for us. And Lord, I just pray that as we read from your word, Lord, and, and look at what has been said um, and study the scriptures, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, and that you would um, use it to encourage us and to challenge us, Lord. I just pray that you be with us. Uh, in your name, amen. Um, there's two main reasons to be a teacher, July and August. That's what I always say anyway. Um, but August for me is one of the most exciting times as a teacher. I really enjoy it. Um, it's in August that the year 12s and the year 14s uh, come into the assembly hall uh, and they pick up a brown envelope and we give them their results for their GCSEs and their A-levels. And it's been obviously really different the past couple of years, but that's generally what we do. Um, and I love it because you get to see everything that the kids have worked so hard for. Um, you get to see their reaction to when they open up their envelopes and they're so excited, they've, they've done so well, their parents are happy, there's tears and there's, there's celebration. Um, and it's really exciting, especially for the sixth formers because they're, they're going to university. Um, they're making those decisions to either go into employment or go to uni or go to uh, college. And, taking a step forward away from school. They're not in school anymore and they're able to, to move forward with their lives. It's great to see those excited faces, faces of people who are looking forward to a new beginning, a time when they get to take control of their education and enjoy all the things that goes with the freedom of going to university. However, as we know, it's not long until they start looking backwards instead of forwards. And how many people here have said, you know, school days are the best days of your life. You yearn for your school days again. You want to go back. You have no responsibility. You have no worries, no concerns, no stress, really. All the struggles of following rules and regulations, wearing uniforms, going to detentions, doing your homework, it all seems to disappear as you remember the good old days. And isn't this such a common theme in life? How often do we watch movies where somebody wants to go back in time? They want to go back to the past because it seemed so much better, even if it was a struggle. And even when we look at our Bibles and we read the Old Testament, we read of the Hebrews who desired so much to go back to their Egyptian taskmasters when the realities of life started to hit them. They wanted to go back. And this is what's happening in this uh, chapter 4 of Galatians. The Judaizers of Paul's day also wished to return to the past, and they wanted to take the Galatian Gentiles with them. They taught that believers must follow the old laws of Moses, and that although they would probably agree that we're saved by faith, they added to that and they said that faith alone was not sufficient for salvation. We needed to do faith plus something else. And that's what we see in all the other religions in the world. If you break them down, every other religion focuses on what we can do to save ourselves. Look at Islam. You follow the Ramadan, participate in a call to prayer, attend your mosque, perform jihad, you enter paradise. If you're a Buddhist, your goal is to get to nirvana. You follow the eightfold path. You have to understand the universe. You have to act, speak, and live in the right manner with the right intentions. And if you master these along with the eight, eight other paths, you'll return to, um, to God. Hinduism, similar to Buddhism in some ways, their place is moksha. That's their salvation. And it's reached when the worshiper is freed from the cycle of reincarnation and the spirit becomes one with God. They get free by ridding themselves of bad karma, which is the effect of an evil action or evil intent. And this can be done in three different ways. You can selflessly devote yourself to service of a particular God. It doesn't matter which one. Um, if you understand uh, nature and the universe, or if you master the actions needed to fully appease the gods. And then even if we look into so-called Christian denominations, cults have twisted um, our view of salvation, or the, the so-called Christian view of salvation. Jehovah Witnesses teach that there's different levels of heaven. There's 144,000 who receive salvation by the blood of Christ, and they'll rule with them in, in paradise. 
But to get there, you have to learn about kingdom history. You have to keep the laws of Jehovah. You have to be loyal to God's government, those leaders who are on earth, 9,000 of them. You must spread the news about the kingdom. You go door to door. And upon death, you'll be resurrected during the millennial reign. Um, and even then, you still have to continue a devout life. If you're a Mormon, you want to reach the highest level of heaven. You must believe in God and Jesus. You must repent of your sins, which sounds pretty similar to where we are at the minute. You have to be baptized in the church. You have to be a member of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. You receive the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. You have to obey the Mormon word of wisdom and all God's commandments. And you have to com uh, complete certain temple rituals, including marriage, to get to the highest level of heaven. And even if we look at Roman Catholicism, if you're a member of the church, if you get baptized, if you confess your sins to the priest, if you perform good works, if you pay money to, to get out of purgatory, all of these things will help you to get out um, or to get to heaven. But true Christianity, true biblical Christianity, is the only religion that teaches that man can't do anything to pay or to earn his way to heaven. Rather, we are saved or justified by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ, his work on the cross and his resurrection. You see, these Judaizers would have said that you can get to heaven through faith as, as long as you also follow the laws, and all other uh, religions in the world would say something very similar. But true Christianity revolves around faith alone in Jesus Christ. Paul here is writing to a group of believers who had been swayed by the Judaizers. These Jews wished to return to the good old days of the law and bring the Gentile believers with them. And the essence of their practice was that faith is needed for salvation, but not faith alone. J.C. Ryle said, since Satan cannot destroy the gospel, he has often neutralized its usefulness by addition, subtraction, or substitution. And that's really what's happening here. They had to add or subtract from the word or substitute the word for something else. But now we get to the fourth chapter, or really the end of chapter three. And this chapter is glorious because Paul doesn't stop at just grace over law, as Derek talked about. He doesn't just end with justification or being made right with God. But you might ask, how can it get better than that? We've been made right with God through Jesus Christ and his death, and we've been saved not of ourselves through faith, but Paul still isn't done. He's got better news even than that to come. So let's read it. We'll start at uh, chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ's, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Chapter 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. For you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want, want, to, once, want to become once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, come, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first, and though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that, they, that you may make much of them. 
It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do not listen to the law, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labour. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. If you wanted to title this chapter, you would probably call it The Grace and Freedom of Adoption. The Grace and Freedom of of Adoption. And this is the key thought of chapter 4. The overarching theme of this chapter is that we are not just made righteous or justified by God. We are actually adopted by him. And we are adopted through God's choice, not of our own merit. It's wonderful grace. And we could probably break this chapter into four main sections. First one is slaves to sons. The second one, a warning not to go back. The third one, Paul's concern. And the fourth one, the Old Testament example. So number one, slaves to sons. Look at verses one and two again. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In today's society, we have a very slow and blurred timeline for growing up. Some people grow up far too fast, and others are in their 30s and still haven't managed it. However, in the ancient world, growing up was a very clear and set event. A child became an adult in a very structured and obvious way. If you think about the the Jewish tradition, um, they had a very clear set of events for a child becoming an adult. Um, they would have undertaken a, a ritual or a, a, a celebration in the temple called the bar mitzvah. I'm sure you've all heard of that. And the word bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah literally means son of the law. In other words, after this ritual, after this ceremony, he wasn't the father's responsibility anymore. He wasn't a son of his father. He's now an adult and he's responsible to God for his actions. And from that moment on, from that bar mitzvah, he was now responsible only to God. He was now an adult. In Greece, um, around the same time as this book was written, when a child came to a certain age, um, they also had a festival. Uh, During this festival, the the child cut off their long hair and it was sacrificed to the god. And after this, he became a kind of cadet who was trained on how to be a good citizen for a few years and then he became a fully-fledged member of society. So they had a very clear coming-of-age ceremony as well. And if you look at the Roman world, which would be very familiar to these Galatians, At the age of somewhere between 14 and 18, um, on a date set by the child's father, they were taken to the forum and they took part in a secret festival there too. And at the end of the festival, they took a leather necklace that was given to them um, by their parents when they were born. And they maybe would have put a lock of hair from their first shave or their first haircut into that uh, leather necklace and they sacrificed it or burnt it on the altar. And they did the same thing with their toys. They would have taken their children's toys to the forum at the same celebration and they would have burned them um, at the altar. I'd like to see Levi's face if I tried that one. And then after that, they were given adult clothing at that ceremony, they were given adult clothing. um, And and from that moment on, they were allowed to to vote and be full members of society. They're all coming of age ceremonies, boys to men, children to adults. And Paul's using the same thought here in these first two verses to strike a point. He's using the analogy of a child being under the rules and regulations set by their parents and then the coming of age um, and inheriting their possessions. Up until this stage, they're no better than slaves because they're under guardians and taskmasters who control everything that they do. They're actually under slaves. They're they're less than slaves. 
even if they are heirs to a great estate, great wealth, great possession, they're still under the tutelage of guardians and managers, as Paul says. And he's here saying that there's a point of maturity, a stage of a person's life when they become an adult. And at that stage, at that moment, marked by their father, marked by their religion, they can enjoy the possessions of their inheritance. Look at verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. And Paul now applies this thought to the situations the Galatians find themselves in. He is saying that the Mosaic law that the Judaizers want the Galatians to live under is like living like children before their coming of age, like living as slaves, like living in the past. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. But now, now God has appointed a time for the Galatians to come of age. He's like that father in the Roman society when he set a point for the child to grow up. And God has set this, um, this point so that these Galatians and these believers can enjoy the fullness of their inheritance. That time when Jesus, that time is when Jesus came, he was sent to the world to redeem people from their sins, like Derek talked about last week. And because of this sacrifice, we have now received adoption as sons. This uh, talk about adoption from verse 5 is interesting language because in Paul, the rest of Paul's letters, he usually um, talks about birth or rebirth. He uses language of being born again and regeneration. And that's true and that's right. Um, it's biblical what he says but here he talks about adoption he talks about us being adopted into God's family and Paul here is using this type of language to remind these Gentile believers that they have been chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be his people God has more has done more than just make them right he has actually chosen them to be his children and Paul tells us in one sentence who came how he came and why he came if you look back um, to that verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So that's who came, his son, Jesus. Um, born of a woman. That's how he came. And why he came? To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And Paul, or Derek talked to us last week about um, being redeemed and how that means to, to be bought back. Um, and that's what he's talking about here. The true son of God was sent to die in our place so that we could become God's adopted children. You see, the law that the Judaizers wanted to go back to was all about works. It was all about getting what you deserve. If you do X, Y, and Z, you get good stuff. And if you do bad stuff, you get bad stuff. It's like living under the tutelage of the law that Paul talks about. It's our getting our just desserts, getting what we deserve. However, we're not under the law because the father, who is our father, has chosen and set a date that we might become his sons. And now we don't get what we deserve. That's the beauty of the gospel. We don't get what we deserve. We get the complete opposite. We get freedom. We get forgiveness. We get a father. We get adoption. And that's wonderful grace. And that's something that we need to grasp. You know, how often do we actually want to live our, our lives by rules? How often do you hear people say, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Just tell me how to get to heaven and I'll do it. Or how often do we want to run away and try and hide from God when we do something wrong, when we sin? But when we really grasp grace, we realize that this grace is a free gift and we get exactly the opposite of what we deserve. And when we grasp it properly, we realize that we can't do anything to earn favor from God because he has adopted us. He has chosen us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins and he has made us alive through his son. Look at verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Look at the wonderful privilege we now have as sons. We get to call God our Father. I'm sure we've all heard that term, Abba, Father, used before. It's, it's used throughout scripture. And it's a term of closeness and confidence. It's probably closely, most, uh, most closely translated as father, or as daddy, sorry. It's that closeness and confidence we have. We as adopted sons of God and heirs of inheritance of the inheritance can now boldly come to our Father and present our prayers and petitions to him, knowing that he will treat us as sons. In 2006, Madonna adopted a boy called David from Malawi. You might have seen it in the news. He was the son of a widowed father 
And this made massive news and even ended in a court battle because David's father thought that in adopting his son, Madonna would just educate him and take care of him. Um, He was actually quoted as saying, I was never told that adoption means that David is no longer my son. If I was told this, I would never have allowed the adoption. David's father just thought Madonna was going to look after him and, you know, pay stuff for him, you know, get him educated, take him out of poverty. He didn't realize that the act of adoption is legal. And from that moment on, when he signed those papers, David was Madonna's son. He allowed the adoption to go forward as he knew that David would not have to live that life of poverty. And this story makes a good point about who we are if we trust Christ for salvation. God is our father. Not everybody can say that. The Bible makes it clear that we are either children of God or children of Satan. And this gift of adoption becomes ours not because we're born into it, but because we're born again. Adoption is a gift of grace. It's not natural, it's supernatural. In Roman law, it was very common for an adult who wanted an heir to adopt a male as their son. This adopted son was granted all legal rights to the father's property, even if he was formerly a slave. He was not some sort of second-class son, as is commonly assumed of adopted children. He was completely equal to all other children that that person might have, even if they were biological. He became that man's son or daughter. Adoption, by its very nature, is an act of free kindness to the person adopted. You adopt a child because you want to, not because you're bound to. In the same way God adopts us because he wants to, he has absolutely no duty to. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need to save us. He doesn't need to forgive us for our sins. He could very fairly punish us. He could very easily just send everyone to hell. But he loved us so much that he redeemed us, paid for us, he forgave us, and he took us as sons and gave himself to us um, as our father. And this is the highest privilege of being a Christian because through Jesus, God takes us into his family and establishes us as children and heirs. We're not just made right with God. We are loved and we are cared for by our Father. The difference between grace and law could not be greater. And here uh, Paul's use of slaves and sons shows this. A child has a father. A slave has a master. A child calls his father daddy. A slave calls him sir. A child obeys out of love. A slave obeys out of fear. A child is an heir. A slave has no inheritance. Who is God to you? How do you feel about Jesus and his return? Does it make you scared? Do you live in fear? Do you call him father? Do you call him master? That's something for us to think about. Section two then, a warning not to go back. There's a really old lady that I know really well. Um, She's sitting in the back there, my mother-in-law. Anybody that knows Janet knows that she's a wee bit of a hoarder. She likes to collect rubbish. And in fact, we've got a bit of a saying in the family that when you see Janet picking something up, that it's another really important piece of rubbish that needs to go to the back of John's garage. I know that the old saying sometimes rings true, one man's trash is another man's treasure, but I'm really not sure how an old, smelly, holy welly boot that you find at Stenoline counts as treasure. But Janet likes to make use of old stuff. She's always picking stuff up and thinking, I could use that for a project, or I could use that for something later down the line in 30 years. And Paul, in verses 7 to 9, makes a similar analogy about us going back to old stuff. Let's read verse 7. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? Paul reminds these believers about their lives before Christ. He reminds them about when they didn't know God, and how they were enslaved to things that are not God's, their old ways, or paganism. But now these Galatians are believers. They have been adopted and known by God. And Paul here is warning them not to go back to their old ways. He's telling them not to look back at their past life because it's not better. The elementary principles that he talks about in this portion are literally ABCs, literally things a child would learn in preschool. It's the, the word is literally putting things in a row. So ABCs, one, two, threes, the basics, childish things. And that's what these things were if they go back to their old lives. They're going back to, to childish things. 
Or why would they want to, be, to go back to being children with no more rights than slaves, without the ability to enjoy their inheritance? Look at the relationship they have with God. When you realize that what God has done through Jesus, why would you want anything else? It would be so sad for me to see my kids in school finish their A-levels and then go and read Biff and Chip books for the rest of their lives. This is what the law is to us, or what it does to us. It's elementary, it's, it's basic. But when Jesus came, he came to free us from that slavery by paying for sin once and for all. Let's read verses 10 to 11. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I, have may, I may have labored over you in vain. Paul further forces the point of their foolishness in trying to keep certain elements of the law instead of fully trusting in Christ through faith alone. The Jewish calendar was full of celebrations and ceremony throughout the year, and this is something that the Judaizers were trying to get the Galatians to follow, as if it would help them to earn God's favor. Paul's telling them that it's a waste of time, and he actually gets quite frustrated in that last sentence. Does that not strike a note with us? Definitely does for me. You know, I often live my Christian life trying to tick boxes, trying to do stuff. You know, how often am I doing X, Y, and Z? How often am I, you know, doing all these good things, trying to please God? When we really realize what he's done for us, we realize that those things are elementary, trying to tick boxes. We're not saved by ticking boxes. We're saved by grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus. Jesus said it's finished on the cross. We don't need to live like every other religion in the world. We are his because he has bought us. And then on the other side of the coin, there's nothing we can do to be less saved either. You know, what's the sin that you're hiding from God because of? Why are you hiding? There's nothing that we can do that can earn us favor or can take us too far away from God. Come to God, confess your sin, repent of it, and remember that he's your loving father who's paid the price for your adoption into his family. Section three then is Paul's concern. Let's read verse 12. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of the bod a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Paul here encourages the Galatians to become like him. And at first look, that seems really arrogant. Paul is telling the Galatians not to be like the Judaizers. And then in the same passage, he's telling them to be like him. Surely that seems a bit hypocritical. Remember, though, what Paul's story was. Remember his testimony. Paul is described as a Pharisee of Pharisees in his past life. He was a very well thought of and high-ranking member of the Jewish society. He followed the laws of Moses. Um, and he was just like the contemporary Juda Judaizers that are, that are infiltrating this Galatian church. He followed those rules of you get what you deserve. But then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it changed his life. And from that moment, he lived a life dedicated and clinging to God's grace for his salvation and nothing else. This is what he's telling the Galatians to do. Don't go back to be what he was like. Don't go back to being what Saul was like before his conversion, because it's a waste of time. Pursue faith in Christ alone for your salvation. It's far better. When we get to verses 13 to 19, Paul speaks about his first visit to these believers and reminds them of their goodness to him. And he probably does this for a, a few reasons. Firstly, he, he probably wants to diffuse his tone. Um, some of the other people who've been speaking have talked about Paul's tone, and he's, he's quite harsh um, throughout this book. He maybe does it to diffuse it and to remind them of the great relationship that they had together previously. Secondly, he wants to remind them of their welcome to him when he first brought them this message of adop adoption as sons of God through faith alone. He wants to remind them that this is good news and that it's better news than the message the Judaizers have brought. This section also shows that Paul cares about these believers. He has a genuine concern for them. He's telling them off in love. And he also wants to show that the Judaizers don't have a genuine concern for these people. They're threatening and trying to convert them because they believe the Jewish way is superior to Paul's teaching of grace alone through faith alone. You'll probably remember that our Lord had strong words of rebuke for the scribes and Pharisees who were akin to the Judaizers. Matthew 23 verse 15 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on sea and land and make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. That was harsh words from Jesus. Paul has a different approach. He sought to win 
these Gentiles to Christ so that they would follow Christ, not men. His approach is different from the Judaizers. They wanted to convert these Gentiles, um, these, these Galatians, to Judaism so that they would follow the laws of Moses and follow them, what they were doing, because they thought they were better. But Paul wants them to convert and, and to continue on through, with faith alone to follow Christ, not to follow him. The Judaizers wanted to win them over to their religion so that they would follow them. And how often do we see that in today's church? You know, how often do you see celebrity pastors and celebrity preachers make church all about them, about how good of a speaker they are or how motivational they are, how wealthy and flash they are. They try to win over people to increase their following. And then how often do we see pastoral abuse? Pastors who use their power to abuse spiritually, mentally and physically. Like Jesus says, woe to them. Be careful about who you listen to. What are their motives? Do they really care about you and your soul? Or do they only care about making much of themselves? Finally then, section 4 is the Old Testament example. Um, verses 21 to 31. I'll not read it for time. But um, basically Paul talks about this story of, of Hagar and of Sarah. Um, and he uses um, allegory here. Um, which is something that's used throughout the Bible to make a truth more accessible to everyday people. You think about this, it's, it's similar to what Jesus did with his parables. However, the, the, the story of Sarah and Hagar is something that's historically accurate. It happened, um, but he uses this to draw out a comparison. Um, and through this, God helps us to understand difficult concepts through a more relatable context. He talks about Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar and uses their story to further explain. Sorry. <laughs> he uses their story, Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham, to explain the old and new covenants of the law and the promise. Remember what their story is. God promised Abraham that he would have sons. He would have a son. Abraham laughed. They thought they were too old. Him and Sarah were too old to have, have kids. So Abraham and Sarah took it into their own hands and even though God had promised something, they tried to do it their way. God's way wasn't good enough for them. So Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham and they have a child, Ishmael. And then God totally disregards that and says, no, you're doing it my way. It's God's way. God has chosen a way to do it. He's got a plan. And Sarah gets pregnant and has Isaac. Um, it wasn't through man's works. It wasn't through what they could do. Their way wasn't good enough. It's through God's way. You see, the Judaizers wanted freedom from sin as well. They wanted to be free from sin. But they were like Abraham and Sarah, or um, Abraham and Hagar. They were trying to do it their own way. They, were, they didn't want to listen to what God um, had said in his word. They wanted to follow the, the laws, even though the laws were never going to save them. The Judaizers were never going to have true freedom because they didn't really want to be free. They refused to rest in God's promise, like Abraham and Sarah did. And through this lens, we can see that our relationship with God is one of freedom. We are children of the divine promise, just like Isaac was to Sarah. We're not children of bondage or of the law, as Ishmael was to Hagar. And Paul uses this story, um, and he does this to persuade the Galatians and us not to follow the Judaizers into slavery with Hagar and Ishmael, but to follow Sarah and Isaac into freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from getting what we deserve, Freedom of being adopted sons of God, his way. John 8, um, chapter, John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, um, says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. As we conclude this chapter of the letter, there's probably a few points that come from it that we should be able to apply to our Christian walk. Number one is that Paul made, uh, sought to make it easy for the Galatians to repent. He opened the hand of friendship and wanted them to return to the scripture. He was gentle and gracious to them. Number two, being gentle and gracious does not mean being soft or passive on sin. We're warned through scripture to kill our own sin and to confront the sin of brothers and sisters in Christ. Rebuking sin should be done in a gentle and gracious way, and this is loving. Paul was tough on the Galatians' sin. Number three, Paul was tough with them because he loved them. Excusing sin and being soft is not loving. We are to deal with sin and call it out because we love each other. We are family. Number four, we are family because God has adopted us. 
through faith alone in Christ alone. And this is wonderful news. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this chapter that we've been able to look at this morning. Thank you that um, we don't have to live under the law. Thank you that we can have freedom in Christ, freedom um, from, from sin, freedom from rules and regulations. Thank you that we're adopted if we trust in you. We're adopted sons. We are yours. We've been chosen by you at a set time. Thank you for Jesus and what he's done for us. Thank you that you're our father, Lord. Be with us. Um, and just look after us for the rest of the day. In Jesus' name. Amen.